Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith, having your Bibles. Let's go, please, to the book of Galatians. Uh, pardon me, the book of 1 Corinthians. That was last week's message. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We began a mini-series last week, three parts. This is part number two. We're looking at the subject, Three Churches. The New Testament reveals to us that there are three kinds of are types of churches. The first church is the religious church, and that was the churches of Galatia. And then the second type of church is the carnal church, which is what we will look at tonight. And then the third kind or type of church is the mature church, which is where we want to be, and that's the church at Ephesus. I think I mentioned Galatians because there was a comment that I wanted to make last week, forgot to make it, and was telling people afterwards, so let me say this, that Paul wrote the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews back to back. And if you will read those two books in that order, Galatians and Hebrews, Galatians will really help you understand Hebrews, Hebrews will help you understand Galatians, and in fact it's really interesting if you read the last verse of Galatians chapter 1, of Galatians chapter 6, if you read the last verse of Galatians chapter 6, in the very first verse of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, you see that he didn't skip a beat at all. It just all flows real good together. So I encourage you to read those two books like that, and that will give you some greater understanding. We are looking at the carnal church tonight, the church at Corinth. We're going to read the first nine verses of chapter 1, but before we do that, I need to uh, set things up here, give a little bit of an intro, and talk about this book and its setting so we understand uh, what we're going to look at and, and lay a foundation. First thing I want you to notice about the book of 1 Corinthians is this. It is the largest book that Paul wrote. It has more words and more verses than any other book, more than Romans, more than Hebrews. It is the biggest book that he wrote. Also, Paul's typical style of, of writing is basically you have doctrine and then you have practical. Doctrine and practical. The book of Romans is that way. The book of Hebrews is that way. 1 Corinthians is not a typical style book that Paul wrote. It was very different from any other style. In the book of, of 1 Corinthians, you have more problem and answer, problem and answer, problem and answer. It's more woven all the way through. Most of his books, there's just a real clear uh, distinction between what was doctrinal and then what's practical. This book doesn't hold that. It's, it's really different. So it's more woven, and it's problem and answer. The other thing is that I find interesting here is that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians when he was in his third and last year at Ephesus. Now that's significant because the church at Ephesus was Paul's star church. It was his best church in many regards. The church at Ephesus was the first mega church in church history. And everything I've read and studied over the years, the church at Ephesus was somewhere between 30 and 50,000 in membership. So this is a massive, massive church. So I can just picture Paul uh, in his pastoral office in his star church, his, his third year, his final year in Ephesus, and he's writing a letter to his most troubled church. So I just kind of thought the dichotomy of that, that here he is in his star church, it's going great, and yet his heart is burdened for the church at Corinth because it was the most troubled church there was. Um, it had more problems than any other church. The church at Corinth had more problems than any other place. And the problems in Corinth were compounded because of its location. I also find this interesting. The problems in Corinth were, were compounded because of the environment around that church. The, the, the city of Corinth was a seaport in Greece. And because it was a seaport, the traffic of people coming and going through that city was enormous. And the church allowed that, uh, the atmosphere of the city to get into them. Pagan worship was just rampant in, in the city of Corinth. It was just all over the place. 
and prostitution was just about on every street corner and it was given in the name of religion because there was pagan worship and so prostitution was there and this church was affected by uh, just by the influence it was just um, well it was affected from outside influences that were that was coming in but the church at Ephesus was not now think about this remember in Acts about great is the is Diana of the Ephesians all right so the city of Ephesus was just as pagan as Corinth, but the church at Ephesus did not allow outside influence in. They grew and became strong and began to influence the culture of their city where Corinth was right the opposite. They allowed the spirits and, and the influence of the city to come into them. So here's Paul sitting there at Ephesus and his heart's burden for this church and what's going on there. So it's interesting, isn't it? Hallelujah. To show you how bad Corinth was, the Greeks in that time and in that region had a statement. They had a phrase. And that, that phrase is this, to Corinthianize. And they would ask people who came off ship, they would come in to, from port, and they would, when they got off ship and they would come in to the city and walk through the market streets, they would be asked, have you been Corinthianized? And that means, have you been involved in sexual immorality? Have you had a chance to experience the sexual pleasures that our city has provided? So they use that term to Corinthianize. That's how bad it was. And so Paul is writing to a church that is in that type of environment and has been affected by that. And of course, we know, I'll just kind of jump the gun for a moment with that statement. We know that in this book, Paul writes about a man who's having sexual relations with his uh, stepmother. And so you can see um, that the spirit of the city was, was in the church. This is the carnal church, obviously. The carnal church is led by the flesh and emotions. The carnal church is led by the flesh and emotions. I need to stop right here and do the same thing I did last week talking about the religious church. We're not judging anybody. We're not condemning anybody. We're not slamming anybody. We're not naming names. It's just that people spiritually are in one of three locations. They are either religious, they are carnal, or they are mature. Or, of course, you're just a sinner. You're just a heathen. But, but man, as we said last week, man, fallen man by nature is religious. So most people find themselves in one of those three categories. We're not judging anybody. We're just talking about these for us to understand and then help people that are in one of those two positions. The, the carnal church is led by the flesh. They're led by emotion. There are certain words that come to mind in dealing with uh, the carnal church. Let me give you some interesting words. Flamboyant, excess, showmanship, gimmicks, flamboyant, excess, showmanship, gimmicks are signposts or monikers of the carnal church. You have probably visited one of these churches. You may have been in one of these churches. I know that I have visited churches. And they, they gravitate, carnal churches gravitate toward fleshly things. Um, how do I want to bring this out? In the natural, have you noticed that preschoolers spend time with other preschoolers? And that junior high kids spend time with junior high kids? And college hangs out with college. Uh, young married couples hang out with young married couples. Senior citizens hang out with senior citizens. Have you ever noticed that uh, professional football players do not spend time with uh, alcoholics? And professional golfers don't spend time with tennis players. We all gravitate toward who we are and where we're at. That same truth applies spiritually. And what I mean by that is baby Christians are drawn to other baby Christians. 
mature believers are drawn to other mature believers. So spiritually minded people, Christians that are mature, look to seek out fellowship of people that are of like precious faith. But carnal Christians are looking for other carnal Christians. Now, they don't really know that unless you hear someone like me say that. and You go, oh yeah, that's true all across the board of life. But that's just the way it is. So you have these carnal churches and their thinking is, okay, what can we do to make our church grow? Uh, what can we do? Oh, I know what we're going to do. We're going to get strobe lights and we're going to get fog machines and we're going to bring in big name. And, and there's a church in St. Louis that I, I visited. Um, they built a bowling alley for their young people. And they were going to win St. Louis by getting a bowling alley for their church. That's been 15 years ago. They still haven't taken St. Louis because of the bowling alley. You see what I'm saying? So we, we have all these ideas that we come up with and these gimmicks. And we have uh, rummage sales and chicken fried dinners, and we just do everything we can to get the church to grow when the truth is the gospel doesn't need any add-ons. It, it's strong enough, it's powerful enough, if you will preach the gospel and meet people's spiritual needs, then the thing will grow because God it will confirm His Word and He will cause it to grow. You don't have to make your ministry grow. But people that are carnal think of all these ideas to make their church grow. I know a church in Illinois that um, built a basketball uh, court and just a whole big gymnasium because that's the thing we're going to do and we're going to win our city through uh, basketball. That still hasn't worked for them. So you see that whatever level people are on, they're going to gravitate toward those people. And then you have the big productions and all that type of stuff. And I'm not against having a play are bringing someone, you have to be led by the Spirit on casting your net. But, but there's a difference between doing something that's reaching out to the community and then something you're doing to try to build your, your, your place, build your ministry. You see the difference there? I, I know that when I was in Illinois pastoring, we had extra money. We believe God, extra money came in. And so we got a big bounce house and we had a big children's splash. But what we did was we reached out to the poor kids in our community. We weren't trying to get people in. We we're trying to get the gospel out. We just wanted to love on the kids in the neighborhood and pray for them and minister to them. We didn't ask anybody, will you come to our church? In fact, I told the people, you're not to invite anybody here. That's not what it's about. It's not about building our kingdom. It's about loving people in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, you got that. Praise the Lord. Here's a... Um, an interesting statement the Lord gave me many years ago. Driven by the flesh or led by the Spirit. Driven by the flesh or led by the Spirit. The flesh drives. The flesh compels. It drives, but the Spirit leads. And so... In these carnal churches, you have a lot of flesh. You have a lot of showmanship. You have a lot of uh, fast organ music, and you're going to pump them up, and rah, rah, rah. Um, another church I'm thinking about, the pastor would not even think about coming up to the pulpit and preaching after a slow song. Just, you would not, he, just, he refused. You're going to sing a fast, loud, upbeat song, and then I'm going to come up there and rah, rah, rah with the pom, pom-poms, you know, and they're all standing up going, yeah. And then that's when he hits the pulpit. That's carnal. That's not being led by the Spirit. And so and he instructed his praise team, Do, I mean, never have me come to the platform unless it's after a fast song. It's funny. Driven by the flesh or led by the Spirit. The flesh drives. It compels. But the Spirit leads. In order to be led by the Spirit, you have to be sensitive, you have to yield to which way He's moving, but the flesh will drive. And it will drive you to excess. The flesh always drives us to excess. So let's, let's begin here with chapter 1. And I want us to read these first, first nine verses because with that as a background, we need to uh, notice this about the church because I, I don't want you to get 
um, a wrong impression about the church at Corinth as far as at its very beginning, at its inception. Paul makes some statements here. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes our brother unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Now, think with me for a moment. He's writing a letter to a church that has more problems than any other church. And he says to them, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Now, Either that is, some, some, I've heard some people say, well, that was a faith confession. That Paul was just operating in faith and declaring over them, I'm thankful every time I remember you, even though this church was a big pain in his side. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe it was a faith confession. I don't believe it was an insincere, it was a insincere statement. I believe he was very sincere when he made this statement because he was their spiritual father. And he says that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. At verse 10, he begins to change his tone. But in these first nine verses, we have great insight. And Paul makes a statement to this church that he did not make concerning any other church. And this causes us to see the, um, the seriousness of their state and the seriousness of this letter. Paul, when he went to Corinth and founded this church, he taught them the full gospel and there was full confirmation of the gospel. In other words, these Corinthians saw all nine gifts in manifestation. They saw healings. They saw miracles. Paul completely preached. He poured his heart out. He invested a lot into these people. And the Holy Ghost was there confirming the word, confirming the word, confirming the word, confirming the word. And it was to such a degree that Paul said, you have come behind in no good gift. Wow. 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 And now, here it is years later, or some time later, not years like 20, 30 years later, but here it is a few years later. And these Corinthians who had heard and seen a manifestation of God confirming the word, they are now at a place where we're going to find out where he says, I have to treat you as though you're a spiritual babe. They lost everything that they had gained because they were carnal. Because they allowed the world to come in and influence them, they lost just about every single thing God had accomplished in them. And so that's sobering for us to realize that all that God has done in us personally, we can lose it if we but just yield to our flesh. All of the things that God has done in your life over the years, you can lose it if you will just relax and let your flesh have a heyday. Oh, Brother Phil, you're, I thought you were a faith pastor. That's not a very positive confession. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the truth. That's the truth. It's sobering. We need to be sober and realize how precious the things of God are and what He's done in us needs to be protected 
and not just make ourselves vulnerable to every wind and that comes along. So then he says in verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. So here he goes, and he begins to talk to them about their situation. So they had fullness of confirmation because they had fullness preached, and they were behind in no good thing. Paul had invested so much into these people. I can see him at Ephesus. He's thankful for his star church. He's thankful for the blessings. But his heart is burdened for these people who have lost almost everything. And the anointing of the Lord comes upon him. The Spirit of God comes upon him. And by inspiration, he writes this epistle. And so I want us to look at signs of carnality. Last week we looked at five signs of a religious church. I want us to look at five signs of a carnal church. Now, I am going to tell you up front that these are not the only things that were wrong with this church, but I don't want to spend the next two hours here. There was a lot in this book. So we're going to look at what I believe uh, is five of the greatest signs or problems in this church, five signs of carnality. So sign number one is this. You will find this in carnal churches. The number one thing is division. Division was in the church. We find this in chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the houses of, of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? So we see divisions here. I want to throw in a little extra. Notice verse 11. He says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the houses of Chloe. When I was pastoring in Illinois, and I refer to that place a lot because that's the last place place I pastored and so I have a lot of fresh memories there but I had some people come to me and say uh, pastor uh, uh, people are talking bad about you and they're saying this 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 and this really yep who said it oh no pastor I don't want to tell you who said it then it's gossip it's gossip if you can't tell me who said it and what the context was so I can go and check up on it and deal with it, it's gossip. I know these ears are a little big, but they're not trash cans. And I don't want you filling my ears with junk that's gossip. And you know it took about two or three times and all that, it's kind of funny, it all just died down. Paul told them where he got his information. He just didn't say, you know, I heard you guys having problems over there. That would have been gossip. You can't deal with gossip. You can't, you can't locate it. But if you can give me a name, I can go and, and talk to the person. And if there's problems, I can get it straightened out. That was free. Hallelujah. And then the same thing in chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. We're going to stay in the book of Corinthians. For a while, one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? So we see that there were divisions here in this church. So what's the answer? What was the teaching that Paul gave 
to take this church and spiritually slap them and wake them up and say, hey guys, let's stop being carnal. Let's gain back the ground you had lost. Let's get back to being led by the Spirit. Let's get back to, to being spiritual. What, what's the things he taught? Well, the answer to divisions is found in chapter 4, verse 14 and 16. He gave us two answers to this problem of division. And the first one is somewhat unique. Because he talks about, some say, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And then he says in chapter 4, verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you. For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So the first answer to division is, look to your fathers in the faith. Look to your spiritual fathers. Now, here's a group, and you've got, you've got a couple guys over here, here going, oh, well, I'm a Philip. Then you've got a group here that says, well, I'm of John. You've got a group over here, well, I'm of Joe Blow. And Paul says, follow me. I'm your father in the faith. I birthed you in the gospel. Follow me. Now, the, tr the letter is going to be read to everybody, not just the guys who favor me. So Paul is appealing to them that the reason you exist is because I'm your father in the faith. I birthed you through the gospel. Follow my example. So we have something here that division is lifting up ministers too high to a point where it's improper, but what brings unity is the proper honor and respect of fathers in the faith. We are to honor those that have gone before us. We are to honor those that have influenced and have imparted into us. And so there's the proper honor and respect, but when you lift it too high, it causes division. Something that's real simple, next time you hear this, I want you to listen very closely. Listen very closely to what is said and how it's said. And follow these people for a little bit, and you will discover that there are certain Christians who will quote you more what so-and-so said out of their latest book or their latest CD, and they don't quote as many scriptures. I got some buddies back home. Oh, did you hear what Kenneth said? Did you hear the latest of what Brother Keith said? No? Can you tell me what the Apostle Paul said? <laughs> Nothing wrong with quoting our fathers in the faith, but if there's more of that than there is quoting the book, something's out of balance. And that spirit of, haven't you heard the latest? You know, I've had someone say to me, did you hear what Brother Kenneth said? Did you hear the latest? Well, since I didn't, I'm kind of on the outside now because I didn't hear the latest. Division. Division. Now, thank God for the prophets. Thank God for the men of God. Tell me what they said. But can you give me at least a couple scriptures to go with it? We go on one side of the ditch or the other. It takes some maturity to walk down the middle of the road. Because you get pulled. You get pulled on one side or the other. You know, it's wrong to throw away all the books and tapes and say, I'm just going to read my Bible. I'm not going to listen to any man. God gave us people for a reason. You're not going to give the all just you praying in tongues and meditating. But you're not going to get it all if you throw away your Bible and just follow books and tapes. So that is the first answer to division is following your fathers in the faith. The other is, in chapter 10, and in chapter 12, but there's one verse in chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 17, he says, for we being many are one bread and one body, 
for we are all partakers of that one bread. And then in chapter 12, he gets into more detail with verse 14 through 27. Chapter 12, verse 14. He begins to deal with the spirit of division. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where, would, where, uh, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And he goes all the way through down to verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So the deal is that we are members one of another. All members are important. All members have value. Being a little dramatic, for effect, I have no spare parts. Every member of my body is important to me. God designed our body that way, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we individually are members, there are no spare parts. We all are of the same value in the eyes of God. Some of us have more responsibility than others, but we all are necessary. We all need one another. There are no spare parts. And so the way to get rid of division is talking about how we need one another and that we are members one of another. That helps not only get rid of division, but it helps... Um, uh, there, is, there is that proper honor, but <laughs> one, one time I was in church and I sat down the front, front row with a lady and she looked up at the worship leader and she said, isn't he just the Elvis Presley of our church? <laughs> is, uh, let's see, no, I don't think, you know, pork chops, sideburns, nope, nope, he's not the Elvis of our church esteeming one body part higher than another is not healthy. I need all of me. You need all of you, and we need each other in the church. Amen? Amen. There are no Elvis Presleys in the church. None that I'm aware of. Unless he's at a gas station in Memphis. I don't know. All right. The other one, chapter 3. Let's look at another sign of a carnal church. First Corinthians chapter 3, the next sign of a church that is carnal is that they only can handle milk, they can't handle meat. Milk only, no meat. Chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men. So another characteristic or sign is that they can't handle meat, they can only handle milk. It takes a certain amount of maturity to handle meat. I know right now I'm referring a lot in my sermons to my granddaughter who's about to turn two. And she's starting to eat meat, but you know you have to cut up pretty small for her. It don't take much for her to choke. And so spiritually we're that way that we have to progress. 
and get to the place where we can handle a T-bone steak spiritually. And I believe, now this is my own personal opinion, I don't believe that there's a lot of people there. I think people like milk, they're accustomed to it, and they don't want it too warm, they don't want it too cold, and they'll spit out anything that has any kind of flavor of meat. Uh, I, I like comfortable. Don't challenge me with any new truth. And Paul said that this group who had heard the full gospel, had seen full confirmation, had been reduced back to, I can only give you milk. How sad. How sad. Only milk, no meat. The answer to that is found in chapter 10. I'm sorry, chapter 11. Beginning with verse number 17. First Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye came together, pardon me, you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also, <laughs> this verse is interesting. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. De heresy will stop you from being able to eat meat. Heresy will keep you at a milk level. And the greater the heresy, the more watered down the milk. And that's one of the reasons of the devil's motive is to, in, to interject heresy is to keep us from eating meat and growing up. Verse 20, When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The teaching that he introduces is blood covenant. Blood covenant. I'm going to give you this statement. Blood covenant will take you from the milk of God's word to the meat of God's word. Blood covenant will take you from the milk of God's word to the meat of God's word. So this is a teaching that we need to give to the carnal church to help them grow up. We need to talk to them about the precious blood of Jesus and how God has made a covenant with us based in that precious blood. Amen? <clears throat> Excuse me. Am I going too fast? Are we doing all right? Third sign of a carnal church. We read it, chapter 3, verse 3. 
Jealousy and strife. Jealousy and strife is such a sign of a carnal church. Hmm. Why, why would we be jealous of somebody else? Why would there be strife? If we are members one of another, why would we be jealous? In reality, it makes no sense. In spiritual reality, it makes no sense. When we see a brother or sister blessed, we should have the attitude of, I'm next. I'm next. My father loves me. If he did that for my brother or my sister, I'm next. I got to be next because I'm in the body. Right? Someone came to me one time real put out, and they said to me, and oh, they were in a huff. So-and-so got my place. They got my place. Did you see what the pastor did? I've been believing God. That's my place. And he put them in that position. That's my place. I said, you're wrong. And they go, what? I said, they don't have your place. Yes, they, yes, they do. I said, no, no, you don't understand. The Bible says that God has placed every member in the church as it hath pleased him. God has your place set for you. It's reserved for you, and no man can get your place. No man. I don't care what, who pastor promoted. Makes no difference. God has your place reserved for you, and no man can stop you from getting into that place. Hmm. That's really liberty. That is so freeing right there. That no man can get my place. Man, it just takes the burden off. Sometimes, sometimes we say things to people that, that make them have a burden. I had, a, I had someone tell me this one time, and man, it just it, it weighed me down for a while until, until the Lord set me straight. And the person said this, well, you know how it is. You're only as good as your last sermon. Whew. I'm only as good as my last sermon? So that put pressure on me that next sermon's got to be better than this sermon, and the sermon after that has got to be better than the one before. And if I dare bomb, then I'm not any good. What's going to happen if I have a bad sermon? What happens if I have a, a day off or a bad day? What's going to happen if I'm only as good as my, as my last sermon? And I carried that around for two or three months under a lot of pressure. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, it's not, you're not as good as your last sermon. He said, you're only as good as your walk with me, and you're safe and secure. It's your daily walk with me. It's not based on performance of how well you do in a message. And it's like, oh yeah, of course, I know that. But I needed the Lord to help me with that, that I'm not, it's not based on how good it is. Hallelujah. All right, what's the answer to jealousy and strife? In chapter 3, <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 11. Hmm. This is a two-pronged answer to what stops jealousy and strife in a carnal church. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build, up, build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Hmm. The first answer is judgment. The judgment of God. That sounds like a strange, strange answer. We'll, we'll deal with that. We'll explain. But judgment is the end to jealousy and strife. And then chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. He deals with judgment of a different kind. Chapter 6, 1 through 3. 
two-pronged answer, both deal with judgment. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not... I'm so excited. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So the deal is, uh, the answer to strife and jealousy is the judgment of God because judgment keeps us sober-minded that one day I'm going to stand before the Lord and I'm going to be either rewarded or not based on my works. Now I'm not talking about soul salvation, being saved and where you're going to spend eternity. I'm talking about we're going to be rewarded for our works. If it's gold, wood, hay, stubble, we're going to be judged for that. So if I have eternity in mind and I'm thinking about what am I building on and when it goes through the fire, what's going to be the end result? I don't have time to be jealous of you. And I have nothing to be jealous about because you are going to have the same judgment. You're going to go through the fire and what your works are will either be there or won't, you know. And then the other, because to me this is sobering, and then uh, chapter 6, the first three verses, is an admonishment that one day we will judge angels. So if one day you, brother, are going to judge angels, why would you be jealous of me? Why would you be jealous of your sister? If one day God's going to bring you to the place that you have such wisdom and discernment, you're going to judge angels. we got to see the bigger picture, because when there's jealousy and strife, it's down very, very narrow. She got my place. Urgh. She got my place. Got to keep the big picture in mind. We're going to be judged. We're going to be judged. I don't have time for strife. I don't have time to be jealous. The fourth sign is sexual sins. Sexual sins are sometimes predominant in a carnal church. And he deals with that in chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. It would make sense that there are sexual sins in the carnal church because it's carnal. The flesh drives. There's more flesh than there is spirit in operation. Chapter 5, verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned, which means intercession, because when you intercede you're going to mourn for that person, you're going to grieve, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily... Uh, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done so this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty strong words there. There's a lot in that. I was at a, a large meeting in St. Louis. Thousands and thousands of people. Man of God was up preaching. He was invited in by a lot of churches in the St. Louis area. They got together and invited a pr prominent man of God. If I told you his name, you would know who he is. True man of God, still in the ministry today after over 40 years. And the Lord spoke to him. And he said, there is a minister here, and you are living in adultery, and the Lord has found you out. He has given you time to repent, and you will not. Your sin will be exposed, you will lose your church, and you'll leave the ministry. And man, it was just quiet. And someone cried out, intercession, intercession. Intercede for him. It was real quiet. He waited. The word of the Lord came again. He says, the Lord says, no, don't pray for the man. 
For I have already delivered him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. He will not repent. And in 43 days, the man was found out. He had pastored a church of about 7,000 and it was all destroyed. Sad, isn't it? I was there. I saw it. The man of God was Kenneth Copeland. The word of the Lord came to him, and he's the one that had the word of the Lord. Man, it was sober in there. It was sober. So that happens sometimes, and it's serious business. So when that happens, what do we do? What is the answer to sexual sin in the, in the carnal church? Well, in this same chapter, verse 11, this is also a, a two-pronged answer. But he says, well, uh, verse number 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world are with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do with, to judge them that are without? Do not, um, do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So what do we do? We don't fellowship with them. I had another uh, situation, the church I was going to at the time. The pastor stood up and it was a large church, about two, 3,000 people. And uh, he said, uh, brother, stand up. He called his name and he stood up. He said, I want everyone in this church to take a good look at that man. He, and then they did, and the pastor said, I want no one here to shake his hand or to fellowship with him. He has impregnated five women in our church, and he is not welcome in this place. He walked out the door. We never saw him again. That's a true pastor. That's a true pastor that will guard his sheep. So that's part of the answer. The other part of this, the other part of the answer is, and to me this is one that's, that's um, rather profound in, in understanding. Chapter 6, verse 13. This is a great truth right here, brothers and sisters. Chapter 6, verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth... Uh, doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication and sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The answer to stopping that and not allowing it to go farther is forced to come into the revelation that our physical body is a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Not just my spirit, but my body is a part of the body of Jesus himself. Now, knowing that we are members one of another gets rid of strife and jealousy, but the revelation that I am bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh gets rid of that carnality because I'm walking in the reality that my body belongs to him and that I'm a part of him. My body's holy and so is yours. Uh, I don't want to go too far in, into this, but you understand that in our society there is a push. They want us to believe that, that sex is just physical. 
But the Bible teaches that this area is spirit, soul, and body. It covers all three parts of us. And it affects all three parts when you're involved in that. And because it's not just physical, the Bible's telling us, glorify God with your body and with your spirit. Keep yourself spiritually clean. Hallelujah. And number five. The fifth is abuse in the gifts. There is abuse in the gifts. Sometimes it's ministry gifts. Sometimes, and here he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, is a sign of a carnal church. They go to extreme, and the church at Corinth definitely was extreme in the gifts of the Spirit and in their operating of the gifts. Uh, he deals with the public side in chapter 14, verses 26 through 37, and verse 39 and 40. I'll say that again. The answer on the public side is chapter 14, verses 26 through 37, and verses 39 and 40. The answer to abuse in the gifts is not stop speaking in tongues. The answer is not, all right, no more gifts. We're not allowing any prophecy, no more laying on the hands. That's not the answer to extreme. The answer is understanding the proper use of the gifts and understanding the purpose of the gifts. And he deals with that, and the answer of that is there that we talked about, chapter 14. And then the other is the private side the private side of the gifts of the Spirit, the private side of tongues. And once again, it's understanding the purpose of it. And I want us to go to chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, because I, I, I see here that if we will, if we will take time in our personal prayer life, in our, people call it the prayer closet, but as we spend time privately in the Word and in prayer, that is the, tra that's the training ground. That's where you learn the moving of the Spirit. That's where you learn how to be sensitive. And if you'll spend time praying in tongues enough at home, you'll get sensitive to which direction the Spirit's moving. And if we all do that on an individual basis, when we come together as a church, we're going to have a powerhouse because we're all sensitive. We all know which way the Spirit's flowing. We're yielding to that flow, and the manifestations will be so much greater. But what you have is you have two or three in the church that are praying at home and learning to be sensitive, and then you have those who, who don't do that, but they spend time watching TV or whatever, and so when they come to church and the Spirit begins to move, they just rush to do whatever frenzy or whatever their feeling is at the moment, and it just goes in the ditch. So the answer is understanding the purpose of this and learning at home. And in chapter 2, I want you to see a, a, a major purpose for praying in tongues, because when we, we talk about the gifts, people gravitate towards speaking in tongues and forget about the other gifts, and it's true that as you spend time praying in the Spirit, you become more sensitive to the other gifts and how the Spirit moves. But in chapter 2, let's read verse number 6, please. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, 
but that which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The purpose of the gifts, all nine gifts, and the purpose of praying in tongues is so that we might know the things that God has freely given to us. That's the underlying of every function, every manifestation of the Spirit. It is so that we might know what God's freely given to us. Even when you have a manifestation of a healing or a miracle, that's just evident that that's what God has freely given. That belongs to that person. You know, if if I come up to my brother... And, and by a gift of the Spirit, I discern that, that there's something in his body, and I lay hands on him, and he's healed. That's evident that that was something freely given to him. It's the Holy Spirit revealing to us what belongs to us, and then getting us to walk in that which is freely given. You don't get that in one service. But you begin to get that and go in the flow of that as you spend time praying in spirit consistently. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, what's the answer to abuse? It's not stop. It's understand the purpose and learn to flow correctly. Do you know why most ministers, I will say most, do you know why there's a lot of ministers who don't like the gifts of the Spirit in manifestation? They're afraid they'll lose control of the church. They're afraid they'll lose control of the service. And I've seen that wrong, I've seen that abused, and I've also seen it done the right way. Um, the church that I talked about where the pastor told the man, stand up, don't associate with him, and he walked out the door. There was a service where uh, someone got up and they just started prophesying. And they went on and on and on and on. And it's like, okay, uh, he left the real thing a long time ago. And so the pastor was so gentle and he got up on the platform and he waited and waited. And then the person finally was quiet and they sit down. And he said, brother, do me a favor. Would you stand up, please? He said, I just think that we ought to just take this opportunity to share right now. Brother, you started off right. You started off in a good flow. But then when the Spirit was finished, you kept going. And everybody here recognized when the anointing went and hit the basement. Now, we love you. We appreciate you stepping out. And this is a safe atmosphere for you because this is home. This is family. Don't stop being used in the gifts. Don't be afraid to step out next time. But you need to know when it's you and when it's the Holy Spirit. And so he instructed. And man, the freedom that brought to the church, as opposed to, okay, we're done with that. We're not doing that anymore around here. Wise man, wasn't he? There is one final appeal that the Apostle Paul gives to the the carnal church. This final appeal is found in the 15th chapter. And I wish that we had time to read the whole chapter. We don't, but it is a masterful chapter. Chapter 15. He gives a truth. He gives, uh, this whole chapter was revealed to Paul. No one knew what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 until Jesus appeared to Paul when he was in the desert for 17 years. And the truth that he brings before this church is the truth of the resurrection. The truth of the resurrection. And we're going to read just the last portion of this, but I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's so wonderful. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be be brought to pass the saying 
that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What a verse to say to a church that was so messed up and was so carnal. But he, he closes this and he says, remember the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, a few more clicks and we're out of here. A few more breaths and we're gone. Eternity is coming to us. We're going to eternity. This is the shortest thing we will ever do. And if we will keep the resurrection in mind, keep in fact that we're going to have a glorified, resurrected body, we will never see death. We will live forever and ever, which our minds cannot fathom. If that is in our mind, how then shall we live? We shall live holy. We shall live sober. We shall live being led by the Spirit and not be driven by our flesh. It's when we forget that this life is short and that the next life is forever that people get into carnality. They get into sexual immorality and all kinds of fleshly things. We forget this is so short. We need some teaching and preaching on the resurrection. We need some teaching and preaching about how we're going to have glorified bodies. That sin, sickness, disease, death will never touch us. We'll never have another ache, never have another pain. No more headaches, no more back aches, no more arthritis, no more having to get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. All of that's gone. Amen. And all we will have is glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I am firmly convinced that what we do right now is putting us in a position of where we'll be for all of eternity. What we will do, the responsibilities we have, will be determined by how much we love the Lord, how much we love His Word, and how much we love Him enough to obey Him. When I get to heaven, I don't want to have to go to faith school. I want to teach faith school. Amen? Amen? I don't want to be in charge of one city. I want to be in charge of ten cities. <laughs> These are the truths, if taught repeatedly and correctly, will take a carnal church and bring them into maturity. You have the religious church, you have the carnal church, and you have the mature church. Next week we will deal with the book of Ephesians, it is the only book that Paul wrote not addressing church problems. The book of Ephesians is the Swiss Alps of spiritual truths. It is the grandest, highest truths ever recorded in the scripture. It is a wonderful book. The tone and the theme is so vastly different than the book of Galatians or the book of Corinthians. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for listening to the voice of faith. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.